Good evening, everyone. Would you please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing at the invocation? I'd like to welcome Pastor Gary Lamb from Action Church to deliver our invocation this evening. Welcome, Pastor. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today, Father. We thank you for a wonderful day. Thank you for a wonderful city. We thank you for wonderful leaders, Father. I'm reminded in your word where you say where there is no vision, the people perish. Lord, I thank you for leadership that is um, vision-filled, Lord, and they're united, and they're moving us forward. Lord, I pray that you would continue to guide their steps and... Um, Continue the process of taking our city from a place of potential to a place of destination. And, um, Lord, help us as citizens to rally around them, to uplift them, to encourage them, and um, to follow them as they follow you. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Lamb. I'd like to call our April 6, 2023 council meeting to order. So start with consideration to approve tonight's agenda. Do we have any changes or revisions to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I have a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Motion approved. I have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. All members voted for the motion. I have a couple of guests and visitors tonight. A uh, couple of proclamations to deliver. I'll begin with the first one, and I will deliver the proclamations, and I'll ask uh, our guests to join me down front of the podium for a photo op. So, so this is proclamation number 202304061 for Child Abuse Pre Prevention Month. Whereas children are critical to Canton's future success, prosperity, and quality of life. While children are our most valuable resource, they are also our most vulnerable. Good? Okay. Excuse me there. Children have a right to be safe and an opportunity to thrive, learn, and grow in an environment that fosters healthy development. And whereas child, a child abuse and neglect can be prevented by supporting and strengthening Canton's families, thus preventing the far-reaching effects of maltreatment and providing the opportunity for children to develop healthy, healthy trusting family bonds, and consequently building the foundations of community. And whereas effectively intervening in the lives of children threatened by abuse is a shared responsibility, and Canton's citizens must come together so that voices of our children are heard by all, we all must ensure that our communities are extending helping hands to children and families in need. And whereas effective child abuse prevention strategies succeed because of partnerships created among citizens, human service agencies, schools, faith, communities, health care providers, civic organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community, and whereas provide, providing a safe and nurturing environment for children free of violence, abuse, and neglect, we can ensure that Canton's children will grow to their full potential and the next generations of leaders helping to secure the future of this state and nation. Now, therefore, I, Bill Grant, Mayor of the City of Canton, do hereby proclaim April 2023 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in, the, in Canton, Georgia, and urge families and communities to become involved in protecting our children's community's children. And I would like to uh, invite Michelle Meek with the Children's Haven to come and accept this uh, proclamation.
it's nice where I get my exercise. So. <laughs> we'll switch gears slightly here for proclamation number 202-30406. And this is for Safe Digging Month. Whereas thousands of times each year, the underground infrastructure in Georgia is damaged by those who do not have underground lines located prior to digging, resulting in service interruption, environmental damage, and threat to public safety. And whereas in 2005, the Federal Communications Commission designated 811 to provide contractors and homeowners a simple number to contact utility operators to request the location of underground lines in the intended dig site and... Whereas the Cherokee County Utility Coordinating Committee, a stakeholder-driven organization dedicated to the prevention of damage to underground utilities in Georgia, promotes the National 811 notification system, system in an effort to reduce these damages. And whereas damage prevention is a shared responsibility by using safe digging practices, the contractors and homeowners of the city of Canton can save time, money, and help keep our infrastructure safe and connected. Therefore, I do proclaim on behalf of the city of Canton, the month of April 2023, a safe digging month and encourage contractors and homeowners throughout the city of Canton to always call 911 before digging. Safe digging is no accident. And I'd like to invite Joe Ordway, chairperson of Cherry County ECC, to join me for the proclamation. <laughs> so moving on, we have two public hearings to conduct this evening before we begin our business meeting. And we'll begin with public hearing discussion of cases ANNX 2302-004 and RZON 2302-001. Request to annex 3.35 acres between Bluffs Parkway and I-575 and rezone the property to general commercial for the operation of an indoor recreation facility. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. As you have stated, this is a public hearing for the aforementioned cases. Black Horse Ventures is the owner of the property. They are also the owner or operator of Fury Softball, which is located just down the road here on Molesta Street. They are looking to annex the property, construct the building on there for an indoor recreation facility for their volleyball operations. Uh, the existing zoning is R40 in the county. They're requesting GC, general commercial. The property is currently vacant. Uh, heavily wooded adjacent to I-575 and just off of Bluffs Parkway. Um, there were some access issues that was raised with the city and county staff as there is some debate or discussion as to the existence of the right-of-way. Uh, I have forwarded you some information from the applicant's attorney, Mr. Chambers, as to the right-of-way at one time was a 40-foot right-of-way. It's obvious the county has not been maintaining that so there will be some issues on that. Uh, the county fire department also raised some questions for access to the property for fire suppression. Um, if this gets annexed and approved and if the LDP is submitted, our, our fire and safety services manager, Ajay Tula, will review the plans to make sure that the international fire code is met for access to the property and proper uh, fire flow to the water meter or the water lines. And the water lines are another issue. They are quite some distance from the property. And so are the sewer lines. Those issues were raised by the county and Mr. Hatabian both for water and sewer. 
during the Board of Commissioners meeting that was held on April 4th, I believe, there was no objection raised by the county commissioners as far as the annexation goes. And during the public input meeting that was held, per Mr. Chambers, no one attended that meeting. I have not received any phone calls or emails from adjacent property owners or concerned citizens. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Green. So we will open the public hearing and discussion of cases ANNX 2302-004 and RZON 2302-001. And we will have the applicant uh, and anyone who supports the cases will have 10 minutes to speak. And anyone who opposes will have 10 minutes to speak as well. So. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. It's always my pleasure to be before you. Uh, this is the application of Black Horse Ventures, LLC, which belongs to uh, uh, Mr. Eric Welker. Welker. Uh, as indicated to you by Mr. Green, uh, they own Fury Volleyball League, which is currently located here uh, next to the AutoZone area. Not many times, perhaps never, uh, has a property come before this board that's actually considered an island. This particular property and the two properties next to it are completely surrounded by the city of Canton. Under Georgia law, that makes it an unincorporated island, which is prohibited under the Zoning Act. Uh, we believe that uh, this particular 3.5 acres uh, would be perfectly suitable for annexation as it lies within the boundary agreement with the uh, Cherokee County. It also is in the City of Canton utility area uh, for service and uh, it would be a great opportunity to annex this property and get a good start on doing away with the unincorporated island. Uh, the property which is next door to it to the east is currently on the market and for sale. Uh, there's property located kind of on the southwest is the other property uh, which appears to be currently tied up in some probate uh, based on the death, uh, recent death of one of the owners. Um, <laughs> This also would be a good opportunity to bring a piece of property into the city that will provide commercial rates for taxation as well. Uh, we hope that you agree with us and I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. We had no one to sign up to speak either in uh, support or opposition of this case. So we will close the public hearing at this time and we will Open up to council for questions or discussion. Are there any questions for Mr. Green? Uh, I do, yes. Ms. Tillman? Uh, so perhaps stating the obvious, obvious Mr. Green, um, you mentioned that there's a fair distance uh, from the subject site to the water access line. Same thing with sewer. Assuming the applicant will bear all the costs as well as if there's a lift station involved. I understand there may need to be a lift station on, on the sewage side. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And Mr. Hatabian's comments, a, a private lift station would be required to um, service the property with sewer. There's a possibility that the applicant could contact the county and have it approved for a septic and a well, but that will be up to the applicant's discretion. Okay. But regardless, the route they go or routes they go, everything will be borne by the applicant themselves. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I assume that would be the same way as, uh, that would hold true also for the access roadway drive? Yes, the, the maintenance and the bringing of the road up to city standards would be borne by the a developer. Thank you, Mr. Green. Ms. McGrew. Thank you. Is there a map of the property that we can see uh, for the uh, uh, projector? Uh, Mr. Green, if this were to be denied, would they build the structure anyway? They could build a single family home there because it's currently zoned uh, residential in the county. Is it not possible to rezone through the county? 
they could apply for rezoning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mr. Benson said something about illegal to have an island. Is it illegal to have one or to create one? Well, it's certainly illegal to create one. This island has been in been its location for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, the annexation of this property would reduce the size of the existing island. Okay, thank you. Um, can you tell me why they want to annex? That I do know. I do not know uh, personally. I can speculate that they got a a good deal on the property. They would like to have a bigger facility, possibly than what they're currently in. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any further questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Green. Move forward to our second public hearing. It's public hearing and discussion of the proposed Central Canton Urban Redevelopment Plan. Mr. Patton. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, this is a uh, advertised public hearing in regards to the potential for City Council to adopt a Central Canton Urban Redevelopment Plan. There was a Central City urban redevelopment plan uh, prepared and duly adopted by City Council in 2014. The Central Canton urban redevelopment plan is an update, amendment, and proposed <clears throat> expansion of the boundaries of the original Central City urban redevelopment plan uh, adoption of this updated, amended Central Canton Urban Redevelopment Plan uh, could be uh, used by Canton Housing Authority uh, in regards to their application for housing tax uh, credit uh, funding for the Oakside property uh, with the Urban Redevelopment Plan or Community Revitalization Plan uh, through DCA. They would be eligible to obtain additional points for their scoring of their application, which uh, would be an advantage uh, for the housing authority with their application. Staff has received uh, an email with a couple of uh, suggested amendments, uh, changes, additions. Uh, one of those on page seven within the urban redevelopment plan uh, there is a list of objectives for the plan. It is suggested that an additional objective uh, be added, spur the renovation or replacement of blighted housing within the plan area to provide well-located homes proximate to employment and shopping opportunities for a range of income levels. Another suggested uh, Amendment uh, is uh, on page 34 in the urban redevelopment plan. There is a uh, table uh, that lists uh, capital investments uh, uh, that uh, the city as well as Board of Education are undertaking. One of the suggested amendments uh, is that uh, the uh, far right column uh, estimated completion uh, the name of that column be changed to years of planned investment. It's also suggested to uh, remove the distance from uh, the Canton Housing Authority Oakside property is that's going to be mentioned uh, somewhere else within the application. I will be here to answer any questions uh, of council at the conclusion of the public hearing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Patton. So at this point, we will open the public hearing discussion of the proposed Central Canton Urban Redevelopment Plan. Do we have anyone here to speak? No citizens sign up uh, to speak in favor or opposition. So we'll close the public hearing. And we'll have, open it up to Council for discussions or questions for Mr. Patton. 
Mr. Patton, um, I know you mentioned this original plan was in 2014. Were the only primary changes of the ones you uh, just reviewed that were suggested amendments to the plan, were the only other changes to the original were the expansion of the boundaries or were there additional? The expansion of uh, the boundaries, uh, there's a new boundary map that does uh, highlight some uh, priority target areas. There were updates to some of the crime statistics. Uh, we did update and incorporate uh, the Canton Roadmap for Success uh, within the document that was not a part of uh, the original document. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tillman? A couple things. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for all the work you've done on this so far. I know it's been uh, a big project. Um, couple of things I wanted to mention. <clears throat> Number one, in the uh, Housing Authority's application that is due, uh, I think, sometime in May, May the 19th, maybe? That is uh, the correct uh, application deadline date. Okay. Um, the, the, the scoring points have a have potential to have a huge impact on DCA's decision for or against applicants. And I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you have an estimation of the number of points that this uh, this uh, effort it could potentially yield for the Housing Authority's application? From uh, looking at uh, the DCA uh, guidelines application, uh, could be uh, somewhere between five and seven additional points uh, that could be awarded to the Housing Authority's uh, overall score for their application. And that, um, just knowing what I know about the scoring, that's, that's a massive uh, lift, which, which is uh, uh, fantastic for the, the authority in the city. Um, so again, great work on that. Are there any other benefits to the city of the expansion of the map other than the benefit that we've talked about with the housing authority? Well, potentially uh, the uh, downtown development authority or the Canton building authority uh, could utilize some of their powers uh, that have uh, been granted to them by the state uh, for some other development activities within the boundary. If the city does agree and moves forward uh, with a land bank uh, that would be created with Cherokee County, there are additional options available uh, through that land bank to do some things uh, within uh, the uh, boundary area as well. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Patton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. We'll now move into our regular business meeting. Um, you have in your packet two sets of minutes. The first set is from our council retreat uh, draft minutes, uh, which we held uh, March 10th through the 12th. And your second set of minutes is from our council meeting on March 16th. Are there any revisions or changes to either sets of minutes? If not, do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve both. Second. Motion to approve and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. All members voted for the motion. <clears throat> Next, we have uh, some informational items. The first is for your information only. No discussion. This is a technical, technical report on cases ANX 2303-002 and RZON 2303-001. Annexation and rezoning request for 1.42 acres to be zoned general commercial for a proposed convenience store with fuel pumps located at Heard Road and Fate Con Road. Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. As the mayor has stated, this is an information item for the proposed annexation and rezoning of the property at the southwest corner of Fate Con and Heard Road. Uh, we have received comments from the county. The county commissioners did not object to the use of the property, but they have some concerns with some requested buffer reductions the construction of the property might interfere with the construction of Technology Red Parkway. Uh, I hope to be talking with the county staff 
prior to the public hearing, which will be, I believe it was on May the 4th, to get some better understanding of their comments. And of course, they will be incorporated into the staff report. Uh, there was some confusion by the residents of Park Village when they got the letter informing them of the public hearing and the community input meeting. They were concerned that uh, the public notice had not been put out. Well, signs don't have to be posted on the property until at least, or they cannot be posted until no more than 45 days before the public hearing and at least 15 prior to. Well, those signs have now been posted on the property. Uh, I got several phone calls the day of the community input meeting, had a visitor from the subdivision and I explained to him the process and I have not heard from anyone since. However, I would expect to receive some type of emails or, or phone calls from the resident in Park Village over this uh, proposed annexation and rezoning. Uh, you remember a great deal of the Park Village has been changed now to uh, industrial office use and on the north side for the Becker development and the remaining area has also been approved for industrial and office uses. So again, this will come before you on May 4th as a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Green. Second information item is update on the city of Canton participation in the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing uh, program. Mr. Patton. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, council members. Uh, uh, the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing did uh, hold a retreat uh, <coughs> in Cartersville, Georgia on March 14th and 15th of this year. Proud to announce 13 of the 16 Canton housing team members did attend uh, the retreat, uh, which I thought was uh, excellent on uh, our housing team members to uh, set aside the time to uh, attend uh, the retreat. There was one citizen that also attended that was interested they actually uh, paid a fee to be able to attend. Uh, that person has uh, requested to formally be accepted onto the housing team. At the housing team meeting last week, they did vote to add that person as Deanna Gale with Cherokee Senior Services. So she has uh, been added as uh, a member of the Canton housing team. But at uh, the retreat, uh, uh, the housing team did have, uh, if you will, breakout work sessions with facilitators. The first one on the first day, we discussed uh, housing initiatives that are ongoing, such as uh, North Canton Village uh, uh, Project, uh, the Accessory Dwelling Unit uh, Program, the Down Payment Assistance Program, uh, the Cottage Home District Regulation City Council adopted, uh, the land bank, uh, we heard a session on community development block grant program application process, uh, the CHIP program, that's another funding uh, program through Georgia Department of Community Affairs that uh, has uh, two categories, if you will. One of those is uh, housing rehabilitation, the other is new construction. Uh, there was a session on uh, low-income uh, tax credit housing, or as it's now called, just housing tax credit program. Uh, the LI's been dropped, uh, so everything is uh, just called housing tax credit program now. We had another facilitation uh, meeting, uh, continued discussion uh, of our ongoing initiatives discussed senior housing, discussed education engagement, discussed land development opportunities, heard an alumni report from the city of Madison, Georgia, heard second year community uh, update reports on what uh, second year communities have accomplished and what uh, uh, problems uh, they've encountered Another work session, uh, we discussed creating committees uh, within uh, the housing team, discussed some funding options, land development opportunities again, and uh, discussed uh, a little further the creation of a land bank. 
Uh, also, there was a facilitated session in which uh, uh, the housing uh, team uh, put together a, a six-month work plan or items that uh, uh, wanted to uh, focus on, if you will. Those include uh, updates and continuation with North Canton uh, cottage site, uh, concrete date for starting land bank. I can tell uh, the mayor and council that uh, there is a, a meeting schedule for a week from uh, tomorrow uh, with uh, city and county staff to further discuss uh, land bank and look at some of the draft uh, articles of incorporation, things of that nature that uh, staffs can bring back uh, to uh, local government attorneys and elected officials to further uh, the discussion. Uh, Want to try to work through and finalize the down payment assistance program. Uh, we have uh, set a uh, a date to meet with the uh, mortgage lending officers on May the 4th, which is also a city council. Uh, no, we moved it from uh, the city council meeting date to April 19th, uh, which coincides with the next Canton housing team meeting. So far, I've uh, received uh, eight confirmations of attendance. Uh, uh, we sent out notices to 25 uh, mortgage loan officers uh, associated with uh, practices within Cherokee County. Uh, several uh, bounced back, it being spring break, uh, several were on vacation with children. Uh, want to identify city-owned property as well as abandoned or dilapidated properties. I've already begun and have a uh, Point of beginning map. I've worked with uh, GIS in regards to uh, vacant properties, and I'm uh, going through those and, uh, if you will, Xing out which ones are part of uh, development that has not occurred yet to, to narrow it down uh, so that we get a, a, a true idea of uh, where some vacant properties are. Uh, formulate an education uh, engagement uh, community outreach plan to inform the community about what uh, the housing team in this program is about. Uh, probably begin a resource assessment, do some surveys. Uh, we have identified uh, what I uh, would call uh, the Newtown area, uh, the Kent Mill uh, Village 2 Hospital Road area is a uh, likely target area to concentrate some of these programs for rehabilitation, redevelopment, uh, new development uh, as well. Identify second and third uh, story spaces in downtown that could be converted or utilized for residential purposes. There was a general session on uh, housing 101 that was presented by an economic development person from uh, Georgia Power. Uh, we have not received the PowerPoint yet uh, uh, through the program. Hopefully that will be loaded up shortly because I've got some questions on some of the data that was contained uh, within the presentation. They indicated 35% of housing costs is attributed to uh, uh, local permitting and development cost, and I think that's high, <laughs> extremely high. So uh, hopefully uh, that will be loaded up and have access so I can follow up with that speaker to find out a little bit more about that. There was a, a session on a, a new DCA uh, program, uh, ARP funding for homelessness. Uh, that uh, was just created and uh, there was a se session on the reparative uh, potential for land banking uh, in uh, community banking operations. Any questions, comments? Just want to thank you uh, and the housing team for all the work that you're doing and it's great to hear that 13 of us, 16 members attended that. Uh, it's a great participation and Great to hear all the progress we made. I know on the initiatives we discussed our retreat just a few weeks ago, and 
here, the meetings are set up and uh, participation and all that. So appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and Councilor Tolan and the team, citizens, uh, great progress. And so appreciate all that's being done. So any questions on any of these updates? I have one more item, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have confirmed Lou Oliver uh, to come uh, uh, to uh, the City of Canton, meet with City Council in regards to the North Canton Village concept plan. Uh, we spoke about uh, having a 5 p.m. work session. Uh, Mr. Oliver requested that if that could be moved to 6, that uh, because of travel and traffic, he could be late for 5 o'clock. So I'm asking City Council, do you want me to put this meeting with Mr. Oliver on the regular uh, City Council agenda uh, of uh, May the 4th or uh, still have it as a call work session uh, to begin at 5? I prefer May 4th, but um, if it were a special call session, could it be a little bit earlier in the day? Uh, I, I think six o'clock, if we could uh, incorporate it into our agenda, it would allow the public to be here six when they get off work, too. All right. All right. Yeah. This is to address comments uh, from uh, discussions at the retreat and possible amendments to the uh, concept plan. Uh, staff uh, felt it was better that uh, each of you express your concerns directly to uh, Mr. Oliver instead of going through me and kind of a back and forth. Right. I mean, we could put on the regular agenda as a, I mean, as an informational item, couldn't we? I mean, we've done that before with, with other presentations um, at the beginning of the meeting. 6 p.m. I'm, I'm fine with May. That. First meeting in May. May 4th, correct? Yes, May yeah. 4th. Great. That date is confirmed with uh, Mr. Oliver. Uh, uh, after council had confirmed uh, April the 10th, uh, something came up with his schedule, and that date was uh, uh, out, so I had to back up to May. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I guess one, one comment, or I guess question. Uh, usually when we have informational items on the agenda, it's a, it's a one-way presentation, mm -hmm. and I thought we wanted to kind of have a discussion with Mr. Oliver about you know, some of the things that we like some of the things that we'd like to see changed. We've had the informational hour. We can have as guests and visitors presentation. The informational items we have, like from staff on upcoming zoning cases, are usually another discussion. But we've had guests and visitors presentation, so we can have it as a guest and visitor presentation. And Perfect. Do that. But yeah, yeah the, the it could be that way, or it could go under old business because Mr. <laughs> Oliver has yeah. been yeah. before council and. Uh, done a presentation uh, about this proposal. Yeah. We'll just have it there and then and I'll work with the city clerk and we'll figure out the best spot on the agenda because I think to, to get him on early um, if there are citizens that want to attend so they can be here at the beginning of the meeting and then we're Mr. Oliver we don't I don't know what all will be on the agenda at that meeting but he won't have to sit through a lot of stuff also but but yeah we'll accommodate him that so We'll, we'll figure out the best spot to on the agenda that makes sense. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Appreciate your report. Our next item is presentation on project updates. Ms. Watson. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so I wanted to go over a couple of project updates on a few of my projects I have going on right now. Um, the first one I would like to talk about is the Highway 140 at Marietta Highway uh, Parkway. Um, and just as a reminder, since it's been so long since we've talked about this project, this is um, the federally funded project at um, the Walgreens there. Um, this project is intended to alleviate the traffic congestion at that location. Currently, the plan is to realign, realign Shoal Creek to line up at Mary Lane removing the skewed entrance onto Highway 140. This project will also lengthen the left and right turn lanes at Marietta Highway. It will restrict crossing movements in the area. Um, recently, we have completed the concept report and it has been approved by GDOT. The concept report details the need for the project and all the preliminary data collected. 
an updated cost ed estimate was developed. The cost estimate was higher than originally anticipated. Um, staff has requested and received an additional $770,000 in federal funding for that project. Um, the environmental resources identification has been reviewed and approved by GDOT. And we recently have started the phase one environmental site assessment for the underground storage. Um, coming up soon is the avoidance and minimization measures meeting will be held in the next few weeks. And this meeting helps to make sure that all resources identified in the environmental ID are avoided and minimized to the greatest extent possible. And some important dates on this project is the right of way authorization is scheduled for 2024 and the contract let date is March of 2026. Um, for the Highway 140 at Reinhardt College Parkway, this project is also federally funded um, and it is being designed to help alleviate the traffic congestion at that location. The original concept was to have a Florida T or a green T intersection. We recently completed the ice analysis and is currently in review at GDOT. This, um, the ice analysis is an intersection control evaluation tool that GDOT uses and it showed that a dual lane roundabout is the preferred alternative. I did um, question GDOT or my project manager from GDOT on what if the city didn't want a dual roundabout and um, <laughs> uh, very politely was told, well, it's GDOT right away. So they, they get um, the bottom line is they get the choice. So um, that is the route that we will be uh, pushing forward from here on. Um, the environmental studies are ongoing and coming up we'll have the project justification statement will be developed. Um, the concept report and the concept meeting will be held. Um, this project just on a timeline basis is tracking about four to five months behind the other project in terms of process and some important dates for this one is the right of way authorization is scheduled for June of 2025 and the contract let date for September of 2026. Um, an update on the Harmon Park project. Um, if you go out there, you'll see they've got a lot of curb and gutter inside. A lot of the sidewalks are currently in. The retaining walls are being poured this week and the basketball court has been um, leveled out. Um, Next week, the focus is going to be start on the mini pitch um, and the stadium seating. So you'll see that big change there next, starting next week. Um, I will say that there have been 43 um, rain days that have been logged. The contractor has not asked for an extension at this time, but I do expect that pretty soon. Um, for the North Street improvements, the grease traps have been installed. The enclosure is currently being built. Brick is slated to start next week and concrete for the sidewalk shortly thereafter. Um, this project is scheduled to be completed by the end of April. Um, on the Riverstone Parkway pedestrian crossing, um, uh, we recently updated the study documents and they have been sent to GDOT for review. Um, GDOT District 6 staff does show some concern over the possibility of actually getting a permit transportation management center. Um, and part of that is because Atkins reported 19 pedestrians in a 12 hour period. According to the manual for uniform traffic control devices, um, in order to put a pedestrian high bid beacon, you need 20 pedestrians per hour at that location. So that's where GDOT's having issues. Ms. Watson. You have a question. <laughs> Ms. Watson, are you saying that in order for GDOT to justify a pedestrian crossing near Ingalls on Riverstone Parkway, that 20 citizens per hour would need to be illegally crossing the road? So, <laughs> yeah, no, I know it's very, conf not confusing, but it's very, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But that is the standard. That doesn't mean that they won't approve it without. Okay. The 20 but is that what they're pedestrians. looking for? Are they saying 20 pedestrians down at the actual crosswalk? Or are they saying they need to see people running across the road like Frogger? It would be, so they would be putting one at a location where there's mm -hmm. 20 people crossing, whether that's and at an unsignalized crossing, whether that a signalized crossing. 
It would be 20 Where feet. were they watching? Where did they see 19 people crossing? It like, was from um, the intersection at Popeyes all the way to um, the intersection at Marriott Highway. I don't think they actually did those two crossings themselves, the main crossings where there already are mm -hmm. um, signalized intersections. I think it was in between those two areas. Anything that was done illegally. Um, but I will say that I have asked Atkins to be here at the next meeting to kind of talk about some of this stuff. Thank you. Um, so the reservoir drive plans are completed and we have approved them. Atkins is working on submitting in the GPAS system, which is GDOT's permit system. I actually signed the, um, the letter today requesting the special encroachment permit. Um, we're expecting three months for review for that, and then we'll be able to get started on the, the uh, reservoir drive at Reinhardt College Parkway signal. Um, and a quick update on the downtown master plan. Uh, the DDA has approved uh, to move forward with the downtown master plan through Modern Mobility Partners. Um, staff is currently pulling together the contract documents, staff, committee members, and the downtown contacts. I look to have a kickoff meeting by the end of this month. Um, we will be having a number of public input meetings on this, uh, different types of public input meetings. Um, I know that myself and Modern Mobility are both very excited to get this started, so um, we look forward to that. And that is all the project updates I have, but I'll be happy to answer any of questions on any of those that y'all have. Ms. Wilson. Wow, you have a lot on your plate these days. <laughs> Um, I want to go back to number one, uh, the project at 140 at Walgreens, 140. Mm -hmm. and did you say that we are we may see some work by December 2024, or is that just some more design work? So the December 2024 was the right-of-way authorization, which is when this, the city and GDOT would work to acquire the right-of-way. It right. gives us the right to acquire right. the, the right-of-way. So we won't, we're, we're not going to be seeing any actual work there. No, we will not see work there until at the earliest. What did I say? My lifetime. 2026. March of 2026. That would be the absolute earliest. Because this okay. is. Better stay alive, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to stay alive for that one. <laughs> um, I'll be dead. With, with GDOT project, projects, and I can send you the, um, there's a very nice large flow chart that shows all of the things that have to be done in order to get to this one one project and I mean the environmental process we just got through the initial step to have um, the environmental resources ID um, complete that's huge that means that we've identified all of the any concern with historical cultural ecological everything's been looked at so now we know what we have and we can start figuring out everything. Thanks. That's a, that's a big project, and I know that a lot of property is going to have to be acquired in order to make those extra lanes. But I know everybody is, you know, anxious to see something happening. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Thank you, Ms. Watson. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. <laughs> You also have in your packet the February financials for your information only. If there are any questions, I'm sure Mr. Green would be happy to answer those. Any announcements? A 10 minute public input. We have Mr. Thomas Weaver. Welcome, Mr. Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Good evening. My name is Thomas Weaver. I reside at 131 Old Marietta Road. It's good to see everyone again. Now that the legislature's concluded its business, I can turn again and focus here. Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank the city's administration and also our public works director publicly. Uh, recently, I had the uh, chance, opportunity to reach out and ask for a graffiti abatement there in Sunnyside, second strike. You may recall from last year, there was some graffiti that I and a few others complained about a little further up the road. This time, it happened to be on public property instead of private property, so the graffiti abatement and nuisance removal process was expedited, and I'm very, very thankful that it was done in such short order. Thank you. 
to our administration for that. You know, oftentimes we hear about things we can't do. Well, the state's preempted this, or GDOT won't allow that, or the weather, the rain, or the money. It's good that there are still things that we can do. And looking at our agenda, Council's in, is planning to invest more than a quarter million dollars coming up later this month, and it's approved by Council for the change order for Harmon Park, in addition to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that have been invested in the Sunnyside community over the years. And I would hate to see that, to see that Sunnyside portion of our town to go the way of the dinosaur when it comes to graffiti. It just irks me, and I, I don't know much about it. In fact, I don't know anything about it, know anything about gangs or graffiti, but it looks sinister enough to me. And I would ask that council keep a keen eye on that and not allow this city, the coolest small town in America, mm -hmm. to become just a no, no, another uh, mess when it comes to that issue. I don't want to see graffiti. I know it can't be helped on the railroad cars. I'm not divorced from reality. As we move closer towards Atlanta, on the interstate, you're going to see that as you get closer towards the inner city urban. But here in town, I just ask that council buy in through the administration and members of Team Canton and others that we all partner together to make sure that graffiti is not something because it's the antithesis of the mural there on the parking deck. It's the antithesis of the art along Railroad Street. I just don't want to see it, and it really bothers me that it was there, and I'm just so thankful that it's gone now. But thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me to, sp uh, to speak, members of council. I look forward to seeing you more often as we progress through the remainder of our year. Ms. Weaver. We'll move into our new business for this evening. And item A, discussion of Vector Solutions Build Training Program Software. Sergeant Cromer. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I wanted to start off by thanking you uh, for allowing me to present this program this evening. Uh, recently, our agency has observed uh, the need to improve our field training program. We began researching a training platform uh, that would aid our trainers and trainees throughout the field training process. We have observed the need to improve several areas, those areas being effective lines of communication between trainers, trainees, supervisors, and command staff. We've also observed the need to improve the effectiveness and functionality of our daily observation reports, which I refer to as DORs, uh, along with other documentation to ensure training needs are met. Uh, we are also looking to improve the standardization of the field training process as a whole. We currently utilize paper DORs and binders as documentation for our program um, to paint a descriptive picture. Uh, when a trainee completes training for the day, the trainer will complete the DOR in a Word document, print it out, sign it, and then present it to the trainee who then signs off on it. That DOR is then sent through the chain of command uh, to be signed off on and then is, is placed into Vector Solutions, which is our employee. So, unfortunately, that DOR is not seen by the next trainer, and I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, training officers complete these daily observation reports um, every single day. So you can imagine over a 40-day stint, that's 40 DORs that we have to keep up with. Um, okay, so trainees uh, work a Monday through Friday schedule, which has been a fabulous addition to our training program. However, our trainers do not work that same schedule. They work a shift work schedule. So for example, Monday and Tuesday, that trainee could be with one specific trainer, and then Wednesday, Thursday, be with a different trainer. So when those DORs go up the chain of command, they do not come back down to that next trainer on Wednesday. So those trainees are going to have to explain the needs of improvement to areas that they need to work on um, and things that they did well to the trainer, and they have to rely on that communication solely through them. Um, Vector Solutions, formerly known as Guardian Tracking, uh, who again we currently utilize for our employee file storage, um, has created an FTO platform um, program that is essentially going to be an add-on to the program that we currently already use through their company. Um, so we've used it for several years. I was just on a, a web 
uh, seminar this morning with them, learning about the new, the new program. Um, but we do believe that uh, the FTO program that they've created can definitely help us improve those areas that we need improvement. Um, which would be to um, allow the program um, to access, I'm sorry, our trainees and trainers to access all documentation that's been completed for each individual trainee. Uh, trainers will be able to view all of those DORs um, and any other documentation as well, along with things that need to be completed. It will provide access to the training coordinator um, to observe the trainee's progress and allow them to take appropriate measures to improve the trainee's access and success. Uh, it will standardize all documentation and keep up with what has and has not been completed in the trainee's uh, file. It will decrease the searching through daily observation reports uh, for information as it utilizes data um, that is pulled from these DORs to create graphs to show, hey, they're doing great in this area, or hey, they maybe need a little bit of improvement over here. Um, it will house all the forms, tests, um, the DORs. It actually has different types of DORs that we can look at and kind of integrate into the one that we may like the most. Um, it'll flag any issues um, or needs of improvement. And then it'll also improve the trainee's success by giving that visual documentation along with allowing um, training aides to elaborate on procedure, criminal procedure, law, um, and along with our policies can be stored and signed off in there as well. As you know, our, Senate, uh, our city has eight great tenants. Um, along with this program, it could provide um, the guide ensuring us that our city's success through sustaining our natural environments and leading with success. Um, the cost of the program is determined by the number of users you have. So per user, it's $38.70. We are looking to obtain 40 users. The overall initial cost to start to get on board with this program uh, would be $2,858. That cost includes a yearly maintenance fee of $435 and an initial um, cost which covers training and the actual setup of the program, which would not have to be paid annually moving forward. So the overall cost for next year and moving forward would be $1,980. I would note that we did not budget um, in physical year 23 for this program. However, due to some restructuring in the Division of Office of Professional Standards, there is some equipment that we no longer need. Um, when I took over the public information officer position, I was able to get two pieces of equipment um, that we already had and were able to utilize that, so we no longer need to purchase the other two. So we could use those funds essentially to purchase uh, this program. So uh, that's all I have for you, but does anyone have any questions? And I would just mention that part of the reason this comes to you is because contract. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any questions for Sergeant Crummer? Ms. Grew. Thank you, Ms. Crummer. Sounds great. Uh, I was wondering, when, when you make the initial purchase of the software, is that, uh, do you get more than one year before you have to uh, purchase license? Yes, ma'am. You get a full year. So it'll go into effect, and then it's a, a full calendar year before you have to, to re-up. So it's only good for a year, then you have to get another license. Oh, no, ma'am, I'm sorry. We pay for 40 licenses per year, so mm -hmm. it, you would essentially pay for those 40 licenses now, and then the additional $1,983 would be paid after that year is up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are updates to the program an extra expense over and above the licensing? Yes, ma'am, there's a $435 fee that we would pay that is included in that $1,983 that we would pay for that maintenance. Great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you. Item B, discussion of North Street improvements. Welcome back, Ms. Watson. Thank you. So um, recently we have been approached by uh, Penn Hodge Properties to make power upgrades on North Street. Um, this would include installing a ground trans um, transformer that would be located in the right of way. Um, as you're aware, in the future we do plan to um, 
put all of the power in downtown underground at some point in the next, I don't know, no, no telling how long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did well, not we mean it like we were going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so with that uh, request in mind, along with the, the newly installed trash enclosure and um, with pedestrian and vehicular safety in mind, staff has developed a restriping plan for North Street. Um, it would reclaim most of the uh, parking spaces that we lost when we created the, um, the trash compactor. I think there were originally 16 spaces. We were taking out, I believe, four or five, and now with this new striping plan, we would have 15. Um, since starting the project, I will say I haven't seen any traffic issues with the one lane. I haven't ha had any complaints about the one lane. Um, there would be an area right above where the trash compactor is. You can see where it says north above the red rectangle where there would be a uh, loading and unloading zone, um, which I think would help the businesses in that area. <laughs> um, and then we would also be cr creating a left turn lane into um, the parking area there next to the Jones building. Um, I do think that we do want direction on this tonight if possible um, so I'll be happy to answer any questions or take any comments or anything that you have so again where we're talking about restriping creating the diagonal spaces um, but also in that one block uh, reducing North Street from two lanes to one lane so um, if you can, it's kind of hard to see. Um, the red block is where the trash compactor is currently mm -hmm. located. Right. That yellow block is where the um, Penn Hodges uh, Properties is proposing to put the transformer. Um, in the future, I know through the downtown master plan, we'll be looking at the downtown as a whole and how we want to redevelop this this area but I think that in my opinion anyways this would be a good way to um, make sure that we are not putting any vehicles in and pedestrians in in danger with being around that um, transformer for one but also the trash compactor so when we do look at the master plan going forward would we incorporate this into it or would this be up for reconfiguration if the so, plan and study indicated a better solution? Sure. So this would be a temporary fix, um, which is why it would be just restriping. We're not going to do any hardscaping or lands um, around it at this time. Um, just to make sure that if we decide to do something different when the downtown master plan comes, it, it, that we did not spend money redeveloping the area twice. Okay. Any other questions? I have a couple of things. <clears throat> I don't have any questions. I just think after, as sitting on the DDA, it's it's literally just striping. There's only one turn in that goes to the county courthouse that's even impacted. Yep. I'm down here every day. I keep an office space down here and I haven't I have never had a problem except a day they poured concrete. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean otherwise it's it's never been a problem. And I think if there's a better solution when we do our master plan, then that's what we'll utilize. But in the meantime, we're redeveloping that whole space. We're about to get local color studio. The, their only um, ingress and egress is on that side of North Street. Yep. I think this is helpful to them to have parking and any future businesses that go into those buildings. So I think it's worth a try. Do we need a motion? Ms. Cook. Need a motion? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Do we know what the cost to do this? 
Um, I do not have a cost on restriping. Um, I'm really not even sure how much um, striping is. Um, maybe we could do a uh, cap on an amount to not exceed. Um, Excuse me. We'll, we can have a cost proposal and, and do it in front of the DDS. Yeah, so the Downtown Development Authority is paying for this particular project. And it's, it's one thing to ask council to approve a concept and say, okay, but that's just a vote on I think something it's just spending a money. Motion without. to support the plan. Okay, that, I'm fine with that. I'm not, like, like I'm not we fine do with other DDA things. Approving something we don't know what it's going to cost. Right. Yeah. Okay. So do we have a motion to support the plan? Motion to support the plan. So motion is second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. All members voted for the motion. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Oh, okay. Item C, discussion and possible action on the ward of task order two for the East Main pedestrian crossing to practically, practical design partners in the amount of $8,000. Um, as previously presented, the East Main pedestrian crossing was identified in the Canton Transportation Master Plan. Um, PDP, also known as Practical Design Partners, has uh, submitted a proposal to complete um, a conceptual design uh, for the pedestrian improvements along East Main Street. Um, the layout will, be, will provide a sidewalk along East Main on the south side with a crosswalk to the existing sidewalk on the north side um, with a rectangular rapid flashing beacons and a refuge island. Um, PDP proposes one public input meeting um, and will respond to those comments and make changes as necessary to the conceptual plan. Um, staff recommends approval of the task order um, to, to PDP for East Main pedestrian crossing in the amount of $8,000. I'm happy to answer any questions. I believe the study area to locate this pedestrian crossing is between Jeanette and Crystal Street, somewhere in that. Yes, you are correct, yes. Correct. Okay. And I, I will point out that um, PDP did go out to the area and looked at site distance just to make sure before they even agreed to, to do a conceptual to make sure that um, they could actually do it. And it appears that site distance is not an issue. Okay, great. Good to know. Yeah. Yes, one, Mr. One Tell. comment, and, and I would like to make a motion. Um, so the public input meeting, Ms. Watson, is to determine or to help determine specifically where that crossing would be best fit. Um, yes, and I think it's just to engage the area to, um, you know, get thoughts and ideas and, and to make sure that this is something that the, the residents in the area are wanting to see. Yeah, folks have been talking about it for a long time. Definitely. So uh, with that, I would like to move that we award task order two for the East Main pedestrian crossing to practical design partners in the amount of eight thousand dollars. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. All members voted for the motion. Item. D, discussion and possible action on the award of change order one for Harmon Park Improvement Project to Triscapes, Inc. in the amount of $265,849.93. Ms. Watson. Yes, thank you. Um, so upon beginning construction out at Harmon Park, um, staff, uh, our consultant engineers, and the construction team out at um, the Harmon Park project noticed that there were severe drainage is issues within the ball field and the plaza areas. Um, we met with the Parks and Rec staff to go over some of the issues that were noted and we requested that Triscapes, our construction um, consultants, develop a cost to complete those items. We received a change order request from Triscapes. This change order will address the drainage issues. Um, the concrete within the plaza area will be removed Drainage structures added and concrete replaced. Um, field material will be removed. The fields will be regraded and um, materials replaced. Um, 
there is a request to extend the contract by 30 days as well. I did not put that in the, um, the contract documents, but I will make sure that that gets in there. Um, I do have some pictures of the area so that you guys can see what the plaza currently looks like. I will say um, it appears, and I, I don't, I'm not the one that did any of the work out at Harmon Field, so I'm not exactly sure, but it, it seems that over the years, different drainage issues have come up and they've kind of piecemealed it here, piecemealed it there, and now you've got 50 different pieces of concrete and half of it's broke, half of it looks dirty because the mud's um, landed there. And um, so the plaza area is the area around the, um, where the concession stand is, where the um, dugouts are. So basically in the middle where you see all the buildings, it's all the concrete in between those areas. Um, so this, you can see this is um, where they have dug a trench to try to alleviate some of the water issues that have come off those um, concrete areas. And I think the next picture you can see where mud has, I mean all that under that mud, it's kind of hard to see, but um, under all the mud is, is currently concrete and um, it all settles there. And that's all coming off the field. That's field material that's, that's there. I um, mean, then the same in this picture, you can see it's, it looks like a shadow, but underneath the concrete where the water runs from the field, it actually is undermining the concrete there. And you can kind of see here where it's, it's sort of piecemealed, um, as I was stating earlier. And then that's where the field is running on into the dugouts themselves. And this, this um, change order would alleviate that and we would no longer have those issues. all I have. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I mean, we historically have a lot of drainage issues in Sunnyside, that area of town, and we're investing a lot of money in this park, so it'd be, you know, kind of short-sighted to invest this money and then have drainage issues destroy the work we're doing. I know it is a lot of money. It's my understanding we also have some owner's allowance money built into this that would contribute some toward this 265 thousand dollars. Do you know how much yes, so owner's we, allowance money we have that would go toward that possibly? So we currently have um, around $125,000 left in, uh, that may be all that we had, I can't remember the original, but I know that we have around $125,000 which could um, definitely could cover this, We or a portion of this. Um, we didn't ask that they um, use that portion first before they went into, or I guess, I'm trying to think how to say this. So we didn't ask that they take some of these items out and say, hey, we'll just ask for a change order for this amount. We definitely could could look at it that way. Um, the, the thing about it is, is that there are still possibilities of other issues coming up and we didn't want to completely right, right. take up all of that. but. Um, I will say that um, there are, I have talked to the engineer, to Atkins, and he does believe that there are some cost savings here. Um, so there are some things that could change that he can kind of uh, work on this price some, um, as well as I know that we have, um, there are lights shown in this um, quote, but we actually have that in a separate item that was going to go towards our owner's allowance. So those, that cost will be coming out of this as well. Okay. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Lee. Was this project bid, was this project put out for bid? The change yes, order was not. But the, no, the, I mean the, the first project. I am not a fan of change orders. I know they're necessary, but this drainage issue was not was not something that could have been could have been found out during the bidding process because it makes it really you know it makes it kind of hard whenever you have a really big change order if something was pretty evident at the start yeah the original scope of the project did not deal with the fields at all okay and so that's part of the issue that that has come up as they've 
as they've been working out there is the water's not, it's not coming downhill, it's actually coming from the field. So what you're saying is it was not evident at the first part of the, when the project was It was due. not part of the initial project. Right. And, and I do understand it has to be done, but I'm not a fan. <laughs> and I'm not going <laughs> to vote against it, but, but I really think that, you know, we need to be sure, because this is a, a large amount, it could have mm -hmm. changed whoever got to bid if, if this had been a part of the scope of the project. And since it wasn't a part of the scope of the project, none <laughs> of the bidders would have had that bids to begin with. Right. I understand. Just bringing it up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ms. Watson, the $265,000, is this um, the only cost associated with extending another 30 days? Say that you one had one. mentioned um, that it also, there's a request to extend the contract another 30. Yes, to complete these items. Is that to get this work done? This is to get this work done, yes. Um, I will say that um, one of the things that we did discuss, um, you know, we have the owner's allowance, and one of the things that we talked about with the Parks and Recs when we were out there trying to figure out how we wanted to solve some of the issues, because what has happened is we're replacing the fencing around the fields, and because of the way that the fencing was installed, the concrete around the fields are, is messed up, so we're going to have to replace that concrete. Well, if we're replacing that concrete, why piecemeal it again when you've got these huge issues of drainage and the concrete looks awful that you're not going ahead and fixing the areas around. So what we talked about was, well, we can use part of the owner's allowance and fix this small part. Well, if we only fix this small part, then it's going to make the rest not work properly. So you may fix it in one area, but you're almost just continuing to piecemeal. And I understand that it's frustrating when you've got a $4 million project and then you come and ask for additional funds. I, I understand completely. You mentioned though, you, you thought that there were cost savings in the 265,000. Yes. I mean, so how significant those, those savings are? And I mean, <clears throat> if council elected to you know, approve the change order at two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. I mean, is the contractor going to find two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars worth of changes to? <laughs> well, it no, because it doesn't exactly work like that. Since this is a line item contract, we'll we'll make sure that anything that we, I mean, it's done by you know the square yards of concrete. Every time they turn in a invoice, they have to prove that they use that much concrete. Um, so, I mean, what I can do is we can hold back. I can go to Atkins and have them look at it again and, and see where we can get a cost savings. The problem is, is that we're getting to the end of the project and in order to have the contract continue to move s properly, this work needs to to get done as well. If we're not going to do it, that's that's fine. They can move on to the other right. areas. I mean, I think that I don't really think we have a choice. We're not building a we're not building a world class park with a first Atlanta United mini pitch grant awarded there, and not and then just going to have it get covered in mud again. So, yeah. Is there an indication of you know how much can be shaved off of this two sixty five? No, I, he did not give me an amount. This was, we talked this morning, and that was something that he brought up when we were talking. This, because of the time constraint in trying to get this together, he, he very quickly drew, drew up a, a storm plan, um, which will work. This will work. He just thinks that there's ways that he can eliminate some of the, the inlets and some of the storm piping, um, have the concrete drain naturally versus putting a... a, a pop in the ground and I will say also that the field improvements are something that the parks and rec department were saying that they wanted to have completed in the in the near future anyways which is why we had um, 
Trustscape to go ahead and give us a cost for those items. I, I want to say, Mr. Ingram might correct me on this, we had an initial quote, I think, to redo the grading on the fields once before, and each field was about thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a piece for it to be re-leveled and graded and, and, and new grass. So when you think about the fact that there's two fields there, now, out of that two hundred eighty thousand dollars, you've probably got eighty five or ninety thousand dollars that's just associated with the field, and then you add on the plaza and the concrete and and, and that sort of that. And, that, and that's included in all of that's included in there. So when the park opens, instead of having, I kind of have to go back because recall we started with just a mini pitch field. Right. Right. And. Then we ended up adding property because the mini pitch field didn't make sense because we were taking all the parking away from the park. Um, and so the project's just, it's just grown over time and it's, it's, it's changed a good bit. <coughs> but it would be, it would be a concern if, if we're already seeing drainage issues because of the work that we've done out there based on those fields, it would be a problem if we don't get it built. Mm -hmm. So when we previously talking about two hundred and sixty five thousand dollars fixed drainage issues it's not just drainage issues yeah. no it's, it's completely new, new fields okay it's a little different so yes yeah. miss McGrew thank you uh, miss Watson would you remind me please and council um, out of which buckets are we paying would pay for this uh, SPLOST so, impact fees so this particular change order was a out of SPLOST funds the Harmon Park field project in whole is 60% funded by impact fees. And the other 40%? SPLOS. Impact fees 60, SPLOS 40, and this change order would be from SPLOS. Okay. How are we doing on SPLOS? Do we have it? We've got it. I see a head nod. Thank you. Well, I mean, to me, it makes understanding that it we're also getting new fields in there, and it's not just the drainage issue difference. And makes a difference. So, thank you. Any well, other questions? Same question, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Watson, remind council when the anticipated completion of the park. Um, so the is. original completion date would be two hundred seventy days. So June sixth. Is that two hundred seventy days? Close. June 6th is the anticipated date. They have, like I said, 43 l rain days logged, and that was from mid-March. Um, so then they have a few more, I'm not sure. Um, they haven't asked for an extension, but the fact that they've told me, hey, we have 43 rain days, um, they'll have to formally request that extension, and they have not done that yet. So roughly the end of July of this year? Yes, that would be my estimate. And would you... Uh, do you estimate how much time this revision would add to that, if any? Um, they stated 30 days. 30 days, okay. Yeah. And, and it could be that those 30 days coincide with the 42 yes, rain correct. days. Yes. So. Man, they're really jamming out there, aren't they? Oh, yeah. It's moving wow. fast. And I think just to put everything in context, I mean, we are spending a lot of money in, in this park, but it's a park we have not invested in in years and if you look at how much money we spend in our other parks I mean I think it's it's always good to put that in context so. <laughs> Mr. Mayor I'll move to approve the change order for Harmon Park Improvement Project to Triscapes in the amount of $265,849.93 second so a motion a second any further discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed nay all members voted for the motion thank, thank you Miss Watson Item E, discussion to enter into a task order agreement contract with Keck and Wood. Mr. Hatavian? Yes. Um, we have several uh, firms pretty much on demand services or on call. Um, primarily, we have been using a lot with Atkins and using a lot with Black and Veatch. Um, and we felt as though we should get some more firms um, under contract. Um, Keck and Wood is a smaller firm, 
Um, I've worked with some of the people there. I think other staff has worked with them as well. And it just allows us a little more flexibility when projects come up and we can, you know, not overload some of these firms um, and get kind of a new perspective. So it's again, it's a uh, non-monetary contract. It's just an agreement. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. That was the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> For now, right. <laughs> no. item F: Discussion update on the old ball, ball ground sewer and Etowah Real, River Trail. Okay, everyone's been waiting for this one. Uh -huh. um, so, as you know, we've had some some slope stabilization issues, among other things, and that's kind of been the big holdup right now. Um, in summary, um, in the middle of the project, the, we've had some slope failures at the top of a probably the highest portion along the route and we have been going back and forth with trying to come up with an option that'll fix the slope and uh, allow us to move forward with the trail and construct it in a safe manner as well as have a, a safe finished product. Um, we have looked at half a dozen different options and um, I believe come up with um, finally an option that will work um, with with everything that we've got going as well as to be relatively cost effective. Um, there hasn't there's there has been other things going on as well, um, but this has kind of been holding up a lot of the progress. Um, order of magnitude, it's two point eight million dollars. Um, the scope of the work, it's about a 400 foot long wall, ranging anywhere from, you know, zero to 40 feet in height. Um, there will be um, additional grading behind that wall, tying into the existing grades. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we're at in terms of our slope stabilization. Um, the other part that's moving forward is the bridges behind the apartments. They have been pouring concrete and setting those bridge abutments. As a matter of fact, I think they are setting those three bridges the week of April the 18th. So they'll be bringing them in and well, three separate pieces and setting them on there and then start. Once they get those set, then they'll start working on the, the trails in between the bridges and then up towards uh, CVS and on back underneath into Heritage Park. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, like I say, it's been a a long a long battle. Um, some of the options, you know, 2.8, yeah, it's still a lot of money. We have looked at options when they first came in. It was around three, and another one that came in at three and a half. Another one came in at five and a half. Um, some of the options were looking to take. Uh, have a lot of impact on some of the surrounding properties that we said no, we didn't want to do that. And so we've pretty much got everything uh, done within our construction easement with the exception mm -hmm. of having to address some of the areas that have sloughed off at the top that we'll have to pull down and then put back. And um, they are they, they were still moving forward on, on the other parts of the work on the trail. Um, they're hoping to get this work started um, May the 11th. So that's, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, Schedule-wise, um, they're probably looking at completing the whole project done in November. Um, the wall, they said, should take about three months. The grading should take about three months creating behind the wall and then as that work is going on they're still doing um, additional trail work and completing all that so that's can where I, we're at can I make a couple of comments please do <laughs> um, so so the first thing to remember is that we did install a, a major gravity sewer line in this particular area 
and the wall and the slope um, the wall and the slope stabilization is more about the sewer line than it is the actual trail. The trail is closer to the river, um, but in this particular area, it is a gravity sewer line, and there's only so many ways you can install that length of sewer line. What is it, thirty inch line? It, it was thirty inch line. It's about thirty seven feet. And so, you know, what basically happened is in this particular area of the of the trail or, or the line, um, we ended up getting in some issues with rock, and we ended up getting in some issues with that slope and its existing uh, rock condition. And so, you know, the the two point first of all, the two point eight million dollars will come out of the water and sewer fund because it is a water and sewer project. Um, but we do have to make sure that we are dealing with that slope in a way that protects that major sewer line that goes with the plan. It basically takes all of the sewer from the north side of the city to the plan. So we, we can't move forward with the trail until we get that, that portion stabilized. And, and, and just so you know that part, part of that cost includes a full-time geotechnical engineer on site as they're building the wall and doing the, uh, the, the uh, filling in the, the slope, that they'll be checking, making sure everything is, is up to snuff. And I would note, too, the wall is not, it's not a concrete wall. It's, not it's like a it's stone wall. It, it has changed a little bit. It's more of a um, stone wrapped in those baskets. Um, so it, it'll be more of a, a stone type wall as opposed to having the grass on there. So and no and maintenance very, that way. Very visible, I mean, very visible from the mill. And, uh, People are talking about it, so <laughs> what's going on over there? So, Ms. Wilson? You may have said this and I missed it. Who's doing this work? Uh, Strack. Not utility park. No, no, no. no that's, that's, that's a little beyond their scope. <laughs> but they're not even helping. It's all with the yeah. people we're contracted mm -hmm. with. So, um, just wanted to give you an update. I'll probably bring the formal change order next meeting. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I know it's been a, a long, painful road, but uh, it, as I've said, when, when it's all said and done and people are walking on, everyone will forget all this stuff, hopefully. <laughs> so, you'll, be anyway. up, you'll be up with me. Well, thank you for making our <laughs> Harmon Park change order look yeah. <laughs> smaller. <laughs> way to go, Dave. You gonna <laughs> name the wall after you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you. <laughs> Item G, discussion of proposed list of assets to be disposed. Mr. Ingram. Now in other news. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be asking for money. Um, you got enough uh, items to auction off to pay for that wall, I hope. <laughs> we'll work on it. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, so it's a really long list of very expensive items, right? <laughs> um, each spring, the city partners with the county and other municipalities within the county to conduct our asset disposition auction. We hold that at the Cherokee County Fairgrounds. Um, the auctioneers, a local auctioneer, Jeff Dobson and Associates, that's done this each year for the past, since before I've, I've been with the city. Um, so this year's date is May 13th, Saturday, May 13th. The auction will start at 9 o'clock. Uh, you have a number of assets there on the list in front of you. Um, I'll be more than happy to share photos with you if you would like on each of those assets. Um, I just want to point out that the, I've spoken with the police department and public works. Obviously, we're going to remove all decal emergency equipment from those vehicles before they're take, taken to the auction grounds for auction. But uh, if y'all have any questions, comments, or y'all want us to remove any assets, uh, please let us know. We're going to ask for council action at the next meeting in two weeks. Thank you. And all those assets, the proceeds go back into the general fund? Yes, sir. Correct. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Thank you. Item H, discussion to amend the Downtown Development Authority's geographical surface area. Mr. Ingram. Yes. And uh, just up front, I'm going to re rely on Mr. Dyer some of his comments here in a minute, but let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, the DDA was passed, was created by resolution in 1981. At that time, 
uh, the resolution calls the service area, calls for the service area to be uh, and contiguous with the central business district. Um, I've provided a, ma a map of that CBD uh, to the council. With so much development in the city over the past 40 plus years, um, there's been discussion, especially with the, the city's roadmap and all the projects that are going along with it, uh, there's been a lot of projects that have been just outside that area. And so the discussion has been had about expanding the, uh, the area of the DBA so that they can participate and they can help, you know, uh, uh, get some of these revitalization uh, projects done. Recently, with the adoption of the TAD, the Tax Allocation District, uh, we had the idea of, of amending that area so it coincides with the TAD because the TAD in, it, in and of itself will, uh, will uh, uh, advance some of these projects. So we took it for discussion at the March 14th meeting last month to the DBA and proposed that they make a recommendation to council mm. for council to consider amending the area to coincide with the TAD. They approved that recommendation unanimously. So we're here tonight. Um, since that time, I've been speaking with Mr. Dyer and Mr. Peppers, and there are a few issues, and this is the part that I'd like to hand over to the conversation with Mr. Dyer, if you will, Mayor, uh, to let him speak a little bit about to the wording of that, how we need to word it, how we need to you know, legally make that happen if possible. Yes, Mr. Dyer. The, uh, we have a terminology problem. So the state law requires the area to be the small C, central, small B, central business district. Unfortunately, we have a zoning classification to call it central business district. Mm -hmm. So I had some concern about uh, the expanding that, uh, causing some issues down the road in terms of jurisdiction for doing bonds that we may want to do. Mm -hmm. However, the more we looked into it, I think our current DBA area is probably in conflict with the original uh, area because originally it was just properties contiguous to the state highways, which came through town. <laughs> so that was the downtown central area, which was, and so with the bypass, the and 140 and, and 20 no longer coming through downtown, that description of it as properties being contiguous to the state highways doesn't really work anymore. So we need to update it anyway. Is, is long and short of it. We need to uh, modernize it. I think with the growth patterns, particularly the mill redeve <coughs> redevelopment, looking at Canton Village, those are considered more down, <coughs> excuse me, downtown, which is what you're really deciding. It, those are now our central business district, not in terms of the zoning classification. So we may have to do some cleanup on all of that, but. The resolution will go through all this history and it'll be clear why we're doing it and that it, there's a reason for it. And, and we will make a distinction between Central Business District for this purpose and our zoning category. Okay. So that'd be the resolution to expand the DDA boundary. Correct. Okay. Right. Which, which you have the authority to do. I mean, the statute allows you to do it. You just have to make a finding that this new area is the Central Business District. Right. Lowercase. Lowercase. <laughs> Not zoning category. <clears throat> so we talked about just changing the name of things, but that's too much. It, we have too many things that are tied to the zoning category, central business district, to undo. So uh, we, we're just going to have to make a distinction between the DBA central business district and everything else. Right. I mean, I know we're also going to be reviewing all of our citywide zoning districts, so at some point we may look at that. I'm not sure, but but in the yeah, interim. Well, so, for instance, just the, so we have an, a, a River Mill LCI district. It is described as being south of the central business district. <laughs> all right. So this, but that is the area of the TAD. <laughs> so you have this, you have on paper somewhere that this isn't the central business district, it is something other than the central business district by our zoning category. And so right. that was where my concern was coming from. Right. But you can't undo that because that's a LCI district with incentives 
that exists? If, if I may, Mayor, is it required that the DVA has a specific service area aside from that of the city of Kent? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. Is the DVA required to have a service area aside from city of Kent? It could be the whole city. Yes, that's I mean, you could, you could determine that the central business would be the whole city. For Canton, that would be a little uh, questionable. Stretch. But, but many cities do. <laughs> many, many small cities just adopt the whole city as the, as the DDA boundary. So with the motion tonight to amend the DDA's geographical surface area to match the city's tax allocation district, number one, still be the correct thing? We'll, we'll bring a resolution to you next yeah. week. Oh, okay. Yeah, next week. We'll, we'll have an actual resolution for you to gotcha. adopt. Okay. okay. So, so a resolution would take care of this. It it's just going to have a lot of recitals in it. It's going to be wherefore, wherefore, you know, that kind we'll of Let thing. our city attorney figure that out. That's I think it's the big bucks. It's more complicated than I thought it was initially going to be. <laughs> it's not just adopting the map. So. When would it be? It was in the DDA meeting. <laughs> <laughs> when, what kind of time frame would we be looking at that? We can do it the next meeting. Okay. It's just a matter of preparing the resolution. Great. Right. We had just kind of talked about it earlier this week. Agreed. I think we all agreed. It makes perfect sense. And uh, aligning the TAD is the reason for doing the TAD and uh, expand the DDA and the footprint and what we can do there. Uh, I mean, we get all of our tools working toward the same goal, so great. Ms. McGrew? Thank you. Mr. Ingram, we talk, we uh, toss around acronyms, and for the sake of the public, every now and then I think we might want to define some of these, like LCI and TAD. Do you mind defining those for public record, please? The TAD stands for Tax Allocation District, and if you will, about a year ago, the city adopted, a little over a year ago, the city adopted the area, um, I wish I'd have put a map up on the screen, but we did, and I apologize, I can have one at the next one, adopted a map uh, that went, encompassed a lot of the uh, up Riverstone, between the river and Riverstone, uh, out toward the school. Um, south included all the Sunnyside area and, and then went out east toward I-575. But that is a tax allocation district where we are, the city has frozen the tax value of property and now as it goes up, it will build an increment and that increment tax is to be used within that district. I don't want to get too far in the weeds again on the TAD, but that is what a, a tax allocation district is. Um, I'll ask Mr. Uh, Peppers to explain the Livable LCI. Centers Initiative is an Atlanta program for a defined area and master planning specific areas for incentive. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Next item is discussion of memorandum of understanding with Cherokee Board of Commissioners for the permitting inspections of county-owned facilities within the city of Canton. Mr. Peppers. We received a request from the um, county manager to consider a memorandum of understanding that basically allows their fire inspection staff to do in properties within the city. Uh, we have done that before uh, when they did, uh, when they redid the marshal's office we allow them to do their own inspections as part of that process. This is just a formal agreement that allows them to do it on any of their properties that they hold within the city. Uh, and staff, we've talked with our, our building official. He's fine with the process. Um, so we, we, would, we would be supportive of the memorandum of understanding and we'll bring it back to you at the next meeting for you to consider for action. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on it. And that would really assess or be liability on their facilities, correct? That's correct. Okay. Next discussion, abandonment of hospital drive, Mr. Peppers. Uh, as you'll recall, we had a uh, development that was on the old hospital property uh, <laughs> off of Hospital Road, Medical Lane. Uh, in the middle of that property was an old hospital drive. It was a public roadway that cut between Medical Lane and Hospital Road. Uh, one of the conditions of rezoning for that site was that the applicant had to get the, that roadway abandoned. 
And another condition of that particular project was that they would build an extension of Mary Lane between hospital, uh, between hospital road at Mary Lane to medical lane. And so basically we're just adjusting the roadway, the connection in between. Uh, but they have brought forward their request. They're in the land disturbance permit phase right now. And this is one of the things they have to get completed before they can get their land disturbance permit. And so I wanted to bring it to you. Uh, they are the property owner on either side of the roadway. Uh, but I did want to bring it to you uh, to, as an update so that we can get it on a, on a future meeting as an actual action item for you. Does anybody have any questions on that? The report, Mr. Peppers. A uh, few items tonight. Um, first of all, I was asked to give an update on the Old Tippins School site. Uh, North Canton Elementary School, the Old Tippins Elementary School, it's actually on Glenwood, uh, which is up in the New Town or, or North Canton Mill Village area. Uh, that property was acquired by the Cherokee County Board of uh, Commissioners in a transaction with the school district earlier this year. Um, the Board of Commissioners has offered to give that site to the City Council or to the City of Canton uh, through the City Council uh, for us uh, to have and work on some projects as it relates to uh, housing and recreation in that area. Um, in exchange, <coughs> they would like for us to remove uh, a deed restriction on four acres of land that we um, provided to the county as part of our fire consolidation. That land is next to the Board of Education site on Bluffs Parkway. Uh, when it was put in uh, to the deed through fire consolidation, uh, it was marked as a site only for a fire station. Um, the county would like to remove that because two reasons. One, the Board of Education would like that property to grow uh, their offices in the future. And two, the county has land that's adjacent to the county administrative offices that they would use for a fire site if they had to build one in the future. Um, so basically, they're giving us uh, acreage in exchange for us removing a deed restriction. Um, and so we were sent last Friday a copy of two agreements. One is a memorandum of understanding that's between the city and the county that allows the county manager and the city manager to act in that negotiation. Um, the second is the actual intergovernmental agreement for the transfer of property. Um, and so we, we just started reviewing that at the end of last week, but we would bring that before you at the next meeting for you to consider uh, taking action on. Additionally, the Board of Commissioners have provided two sets of uh, American Rescue Plan Act funding with the anticipation that those funds would be spent on that site. A portion of those dollars was allocated to um, Camp Housing Authority to go towards the demolition of the old school, not the gymnasium, but the old school. Another portion of funds was given to the Housing Authority for the construction of some residential units. If they are not sure what those units would be yet, they're, they're not fully involved in that particular process. Um, the other portion of funds was given to Must Ministries for also a residential project up there. The agreements that we have with the county for the transfer of property don't tie our hands in that it has to be used for a specific use. And so that's something that we could work out after the fact. But the funds that those two organizations have have to be committed by the end of 2024 and spent by 2026. So uh, we had a meeting uh, I met earlier this week uh, with representatives from those two organizations to kind of hear about what they were thinking when they applied for that funding with the county. Um, it doesn't sound like either one of them are, are really at a point where they know exactly what they plan to do. Um, there are some questions that the Housing Authority has as it relates to some of the units um, and, of course, what's going on with their applications at Oakside. And so we, we would suggest that the city continue to move forward on the property transaction, knowing that we can work through some of those things in that process after we take over the property. Um, 
but again, if you have any particular questions on that or information for me to ask, I'm happy to do so. Um, but we'll be bringing that those agreements to you at the next meeting for your consideration. Uh, the second item I was asked to look into, it actually came up at the retreat, um, was about electric bicycles in the city's parks. Um, our parks ordinance, if you'll recall, last year when we were going through the process of redoing the city's ordinances, the parks and recreation chapter um, was held out. We did not go into that chapter for changes because at the time we were working on some improvements with different park projects and we wanted to hold off on making changes to that chapter until we had some more of those projects completed. There are three sections that, that I identified in here where it talks about motorized vehicles. And so when you think about that from the staff standpoint, an electric electric bike does have a motor to it. It's just not gas powered, it's electric powered. Um, and so we would really need to change some of the definition in there to make sure that it clearly allows electric bikes and that we're not considering them to be in the same category as a gas powered uh, vehicle. Um, so we will be bringing back to you at the next meeting um, an outline of what those specific changes would be so that we can get those changed in the ordinance amendment. Um, and then there's a couple of other tweaks to language that need to be done at the same time. Um, for example, there's one section in here that says you can smoke in the park in designated areas, but we do not allow smoking on public property, so we would not have any designated areas within the park. So we'll make a few of those changes at the same time and bring it back to you later this month. And just keeping in mind, the reason we have ended up with a messy parks ordinance is from piecemeal changes like we're talking about doing. <laughs> so ultimately, we need to say there's just a policy rather than have an ordinance say it's allowed in Bowling Park. And then we have Heritage Park added. We didn't add Heritage to it. <clears throat> and while this change might help us in the interim, also recall that sometime over the summer we'll be moving forward with an, a request for proposals for a Parks and Recreation Master Plan. And a lot of what we're doing in the parks and then that particular ordinance would be changed based upon that master plan. So that's a quick fix now versus something that'll be more long term over the next year. Um, I did want to. Uh, update you on Georgia Cities Week. Uh, that is the last week of this month, and I know we've put some social media out. Uh, Lauren Johnson's been working hard on that for us, so we appreciate her hard work in putting that together. Um, just a couple of, of overviews for that week. On Monday the 24th, we will have our uh, team uh, job and resources fair back here in the auditorium. We did that last year, and it was folks. Uh, we had a room full of different vendors that were looking for part-time, full-time employee uh, options, internships, volunteer opportunities with nonprofits. We assisted with some things on resumes for the, for the youth, and so that will be back on April 24th from 3 to 6. Um, on April 25th, Tuesday, there will be a town hall meeting at St. Paul AME out, um, out in the Stumptown community. Um, it starts at 6 o'clock. On the 26th, the Wednesday, uh, we will be having an open house here in the auditorium um, from 4 to 7. Uh, the idea behind that, that open house is that we will have tenant uh, booths or, or, or tables set up for each of the tenants that we have in our roadmap, outlining the projects that the city is working on and providing an opportunity for public input and feedback on those, as well as other, other uh, booth spaces here. Uh, representing other partners that we have in the community. So that'll be on Wednesday night from, uh, from 4 to 7. Then the next morning we will open that back up from 10 to 1 in the same room so that individuals who might have a better time coming during the day as opposed to the evening could come in at that time. Also on the 27th, beginning at 4.30, is the Taste of Canton down Etowa. Uh, and that is being put on by our Main Street Board in, in collaboration with, with others uh, to showcase the many restaurant, food, and beverage options that we have in the city. Uh, that's from 4.30 to 8.30 p.m. On Friday the 28th, we kick off the Peaberry Film Festival. That's the independent film festival that takes place at the Canton Theater. Uh, and 
there. There's more information coming out about that. And then on Saturday the 29th, we have Garden in the Park, which is at Cannon Park. That's an event that's being put on by Main Street, the Environmental and Sustainability Board, as well as Canton Tourism. Uh, and involves everything from gardening to plants to uh, uh, handmade goods and, and, and the like uh, to finish out the month. So we got a lot of activities that week. Get your name tags ready because you'll be running around all week with the rest of us uh, <laughs> for those events. Uh, the last thing I had was just an update. Uh, we were contacted after the last meeting back for their um, uh, occupational tax. Hopefully that will be resolved in the next couple of days. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have on any items. Any questions for Mr. Peppers? Thank you, Mr. Peppers. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any council introduced items? Just checking. I have uh, just one item this evening. Um, and that is the reappointment of Carmen Slaughter as our representative to the Sequoia Regional Library System Library Board. Um, gotten great uh, reports from the executive director, Angelina Cortellino, about how well Ms. Slaughter has uh, served us, the city. And uh, I know in speaking with Ms. Slaughter, she uh, enjoys that work immensely and has done a great job and is a great representative. So I would like to nominate her for a reappointment for a three-year term beginning July 1st and um, uh, ask for a second and a, and a vote. Second. So we have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Uh, all members voted for the motion. And um, Ms. Schmidt, would you like to make an announcement for the mural ribbon cutting? So. Sure. I just wanted to add that um, the mural ribbon cutting for the new mural on the city parking deck will be April 13th. Uh, 5 p.m. The artist will be there and we'll have some live music and some goodies related to the mural. Great. Look forward to celebrating that wonderful new addition to the city. So, And with that, we do need to adjourn to executive session to discuss real estate and litigation. So I'll have appropriate motion to do so. Motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss real estate and litigation. Second. So motion and second. All in favor say aye. Opposed nay? We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>